Hi everyone, in this video we are going to take a look at a couple of interesting properties of complex functions uh, that have applications in physics. And our starting point is basically the stuff which I've already put on the screen. We've got our generic complex variable z, which is x plus i, y. x and y are real numbers, so x is the real part, y is the imaginary part of z. And we've got some function f of z, which itself has a complex value, and we can write f of z as u plus iv, where u is the real part of f and v is the imaginary part of f. And because f depends on z, u and v can be thought of as the functions of both x and y. Now for this video, we're only going to look at analytic functions, which basically means functions that are complex differentiable. Now, if a function is complex differentiable, then it's real and imaginary parts u and v automatically satisfy these two equations that I've written out here. They're called the cauchy riemann equations, labeled them one and two, and I'm not going to prove them in this video. It's a very standard proof that you can go and look up. So if we have an analytic function of z, then um, it's, it's real and imaginary parts u and v must automatically satisfy those two equations. And it turns out that it's these two equations that lead to some important conclusions that can help us to solve certain problems in areas of physics like electrostatics and gravity and fluid dynamics and probably others as well. So firstly, note that equations one and two are a system of coupled first order partial differential equations, coupled in the sense that they both involve u and v. So what we can do is differentiate both of them, turn them into second order differential equations, but in doing so, we kind of decouple them uh, in the sense that we can get one equation involving only u and one equation involving only v. Now, the way to do that uh, is take the first equation. Um, we can differentiate it with respect to x, and you get dtu by dx squared is d2v by dx dy. And I'm going to call that equation 3. Now, Notice that we've got this mixed second partial derivative here, d2v by dx dy. We could get a similar mixed partial derivative from equation 2 by differentiating equation 2 with respect to y. Now to see how that works, I'll just write out um, what we would get if we differentiate equation 2 with respect to y. Uh, you're going to get d2u by dy squared is minus d2v uh, by dy dx. I'm going to call that equation 4. And the dx and the dy are swapped around, but second partial derivatives commute. And so we can consider uh, the right-hand sides of equations 3 and 4 to be the same, um, give or take a minus sign. So that means we can use equations 3 and 4 to eliminate that mixed second partial derivative um, and conclude that d to u by dx squared is equal to minus d to u by dy squared. Um, or if we want to put everything on the same side, we get d to u by dx squared plus d to u by dy squared is zero. In other words, the Laplacian del squared of u is equal to zero. And therefore, um, the real part of f, in other words, u, uh, has to obey Laplace's equation. How about the imaginary part v? Can we derive an equivalent equation for that? Well, it turns out that all you have to do is um, differentiate equations one and two the other way around. In other words, you do d1 by dy instead of d1 by dx, and you take equation two and differentiate that one with respect to x, then you get a different mixed second order partial derivative, um, which is going to be d to u by dy dx and d to u by dx dy. You eliminate uh, that mixed derivative as we did in the previous case, and by the same reasoning, you arrive at the conclusion that del squared v is equal to zero as well. So uh, u and v independently have to, to satisfy Laplace's equation. Now this is useful because if we know that a particular complex function is analytic, we just write down its real and imaginary parts, and we automatically have two different solutions to Laplace's equation. And that's a good thing because Laplace's equation turns up all over the place in physics. I mentioned um, some of the applications earlier. But for example, in electrostatics, if you have a region where there are no charges, um, then the electrostatic potential has to satisfy Laplace equation. So either u or v um, could, could represent the electrostatic potential in some particular configuration of, of boundary conditions. 
it is worth pointing out that the Laplace equation that we've got for both u and v um, is the 2D Laplace equation, not the 3D Laplace equation, because the original complex variable z, um, well, it's a complex variable, so it only has two distinct parts, right? It's got um, x and it's got y, the real and imaginary parts. There is no third bit of a complex number. And so um, this fact that we've, um, that we've deduced about complex functions is only really helpful for solving um, physics problems that can be thought of as two-dimensional. Of course, the real world is three-dimensional, but there are some problems that can be thought of as two-dimensional. Um, in particular, like if you have um, a, con a configuration of conductors or charges that extends infinitely far into the third dimension, um, then none of the electric fields or potentials can depend on the distance along that third direction, right? So if you've got, for example, two infinitely long line charges, then um, the potential in the region between the line charges would, would satisfy the 2D Laplace equation. So that's our first useful property of complex functions, but we can take it a bit further than that and derive another useful property. Now, the second property that we're going to talk about um, concerns lines of constant u and lines of constant v um, in the complex plane, the xy plane. So what we're going to do um, is consider a particular line um, which has the implicit equation uh, u, which I'm going to write out explicitly as a function of x and y, is some constant, right? So this equation here, u equals k, where k is a constant, defines a line in the complex plane. So if you consider moving along that line, um, well, for obvious reasons, you can say that du, in other words, any small change in u, is zero as you move along the line, right? Because by definition, u is constant along that line. So what we can do is expand out that du, the little change in u, in terms of changes in x and y, dx and dy, using partial derivatives. So du um, is going to be the partial derivative of u with respect to x times a small change in x, um, plus the partial derivative of u with respect to y times any small change in y, and that is supposed to be zero. Now, this is interesting because we can rearrange this um, to get an expression for dy by dx, and dy by dx, of course, is just the gradient um, of the line that we're looking at. And I'm going to write this in slightly more compact notation, follow straightforwardly from, from this rearranging. It's minus dx u, partial derivative of u with respect to x, um, by dy u. I'm just adopting that more compact notation so that we don't have a fraction with fractions on both the top and the bottom. Okay, so we know the gradient of any line of constant u or we have an ex a way to find the gradient of any line of constant u. Um, what about lines of constant v? So I'm just going to say here, well, similarly, if we have an implicit equation v of x and y is equal to some other constant, we can just call it k dash, um, by exactly the same logic, there wouldn't really be any difference um, to, to what we just did with the the u equals constant curve, except we have to replace the u's with v's, right? So the, the dy by dx expression for our v equals constant curve would be minus um, dx v um, by dy v. Now something interesting happens when we multiply those two gradients that we've just derived um, together. So the gradient of the v equals constant curve was minus dx v um, by dy v. And the gradient of the u equals constant curve was minus uh, dx u um, by dy u. Now, what's that equal to? Well, we can use the cauchy riemann equations, 1 and 2 at the top of the screen, to make some simplifications. In particular, um, note that uh, from equation 2, um, minus dx v is the same as dy of u. Right, so those two circled terms in that equation at the bottom there um, cancel out and just give one. Um, and so let's cross those out and just put ones in place of those. Um, what about the other terms? Well, from equation one, the first cauchy riemann equation, um, dy of v is the same as dx of u without the minus sign, right? And so uh, we can do some more cancelling. This time, we turn that into a one. Um, the minus dx u would become minus one, right? Because the first Cauchy-Riemann equation doesn't have a minus sign in it. So all of that 
is equal to minus one. Now, of course, if you have two lines or curves and you multiply the gradients together and you get minus one, then that implies that the lines or curves are perpendicular to each other. And so we've just shown that uh, curves of constant u and curves of constant v um, form two orthogonal sets of curves, right? Because the product of the gradients is minus one, completely independent of where in the complex plane we are, right? And we get minus one uh, regardless of the value of x or y. So what's the physical importance of this? Well, let's say for a particular problem, we choose to interpret uh, the real part of f, in other words, u, um, as the electrostatic potential. So that means lines of constant u, or really surfaces of constant u, are equipotential surfaces. They might be, for example, conducting surfaces because conductors are equipotentials. We've just shown that the lines of constant v are always perpendicular to those equipotentials. Now, in electrostatics, we know that the electric field is minus the gradient of the potential, and therefore the electric field is always perpendicular to equipotentials. And so um, the set of uh, curves with equation v equals a constant um, gives us implicit equations for the field lines. Now, of course, you can do the whole thing the other way around as well, um, by which I mean that you can choose v to represent the electrostatic potential, in which case lines of constant u um, would give you the equations of, uh, of the electric field lines. How would you actually decide whether it's u or v that should be interpreted as the potential for a particular problem? Well, it's just down to the boundary conditions because you need to make sure um, that any conducting surfaces in your problem um, are equipotential surfaces. Okay, well, I think that's enough for this time. Thanks for watching and see you soon.